This Sunday will mark the 104th running of the Indianapolis 500 at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. It will be one of the most unique races in the race's history. It will be the first time in the history of the race that it's run outside the month of May. First time that it's run without spectators. But the race will be run. And that is extraordinary itself, given the obstacles that we faced this year. But it's not the first time that the greatest spectacle in racing has faced challenges. During the Second World War, there was a very real chance that the brickyard would be transformed into a housing development. The race might not be anything other than forgotten history, were not for the extraordinary efforts of one of its most legendary drivers, and a man most known for a brand of baking powder. It is history that deserves to be remembered. When Wilbur Shaw won the 28th Indianapolis 500 at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in 1940, he became the first driver in history to win in consecutive years. Having previously won in 1937 and 1939, he became just the second driver, following Louis Meyer, to win the race three times. Given the number of laps that he had led in the 13 years that he had run the race, and his three second place finishes in addition to his three wins, many already considered Shaw the outstanding driver in the history of the race to that point. Shaw came by his love of racing early. The website Indy Speedway notes that he was building race cars for a living at the age of 17 and won his first race in 1921, driving a car he built from junk parts. In 1941, he came to defend his Indianapolis 500 title, seeking an unprecedented third consecutive and fourth overall win. But it was not to be. Leading the race on lap 152, his car hit the wall going through turn one when the right wheel collapsed. His chances for a third consecutive win were dashed. He later said, I sure thought it was going to be payday again. I had made my last pit stop, had a good lead, and everything looked perfect. But little could he know that events later in 1941 might end the race forever. In December came the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. On December 28th, Speedway owner Eddie Rickenbacker, himself a former racer and famous World War I fighter ace, declared that the race would be suspended for the duration of the war. He said, Tradition and priorities demand that we again voluntarily abandon the annual 500-mile race at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in the interest of full-out victory effort. In 1942, the government would shut down all motorsport during the war, largely due to fuel rationing. It was not the first time that the race had been suspended due to war. The race had not been held in 1917 and 1918 as a result of the U.S. involvement in the Great War. In fact, the Speedway had been used as an army landing field during the war. But the suspension during the Second World War would produce a greater challenge. Disuse. Track historian Donald Davidson explained, When Rickenbacker shut down the track, they had a golf course, and the golf course apparently continued to operate, but the rest of the place was allowed to just sit, and nothing was done to it. No maintenance. Zero. During the war, Wilbershaw worked as a director of sales engineering for Firestone Aviation Company in Akron. The Akron Journal wrote at the time, W. Wilbur Shaw, handsome, dapper, mustache speedway champion, now an Akronite and member of the sales department of Firestone Aircraft Company. Firestone had been working on a synthetic rubber tire for passenger car use after the war. In 1944, they secured permission from the federal government to go test their new tire on the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, which had originally been built in 1909 as a proving ground. Davidson explained, Shaw found the track in just deplorable condition. The infield had become a jungle. There were weeds coming up through the track surface. The wooden stands were rotting, just like in a, an abandoned army camp. The general thinking among the locals at the time was that when the war was over, it would become a housing development. Occasionally there would be stories that Rickenbacker planned to restore the race after the war, as well as stories about possibly selling the track. It was briefly reported that the local American Legion might purchase the track, but nothing seemed to materialize. Appalled at the state of the track, Shaw went to New York to meet with Rickenbacker, who by that time was president of Eastern Airlines, at the airline headquarters in New York. The two had known each other for years. Shaw had actually been driving when Rickenbacker had bought the track in 1927. Rickenbacker told Shaw that he intended to keep operating the track, but if there was a potential buyer, he'd be interested in talking to them. And the potential buyer was Wilbur Shaw himself. Davidson mentioned that while Shaw came from very meager beginnings, he was a very dynamic and charismatic character. He'd made quite a lot of money, both in racing and in business, and could put up a substantial sum, and apparently envisioned finding some partners and purchasing the track. Shaw went looking for 20 investors. The exact sale amount has never been made public, but Davidson says that seven hundred dollars or $750,000 were the numbers bandied about at the time. 
Shaw was well known in Indianapolis and went to sportsmen or companies that had been involved in racing. But it didn't go as planned. Davidson noted he was either getting no thank yous or companies that would say, that's great, we'd be very interested, but that he realized that they only wanted it for their own benefit. Shaw didn't want something like product exclusivity where there wouldn't be competition. Still, Shaw thought the race should go on. In June, he was quoted in the Cumberland Evening Times. The Speedway is just too good a thing to just let it die. The breakthrough came when an old friend from racing named Homer Cochran, who had become a real estate broker, mentioned a businessman from Terre Haute with whom he'd done some business and whom he thought might be interested. Tony Holman was a Yale graduate who had driven in the Red Cross Ambulance Corps at the age of just 17 during the First World War. In 1945, 44-year-old Holman was president of Holman & Company, a successful wholesale food supplier that covered 85 counties in Indiana, Kentucky, and Illinois, and that had been in Holman's family since the business was started in 1850. The company was perhaps best known for the Clabber Girl brand of baking powder, which Holman had brought to national prominence. Cochran said that he had done some deals with Holman. Since the 1930s, Holman and his company had been finding companies that had fallen on hard times, but had potential buying them, saving them, building them up, and then selling them. The broker thought that Holman may be interested in a deal over the Speedway. The Indianapolis News said in May of 1946, the three-time winner of the 500-mile race hurried to Terre Haute with a prospectus and a proposed deal. Davidson notes that the date of their first meeting was not clear, but was likely in September or early October 1945. Shaw found out that not only was Holman interested, but that he shared a love for the Speedway. He had, it turns out, first attended the race in 1914, when he was 13 years old, and it made a great impression on him. Davidson has actually talked to Holman about the trip and said, just the look in his eyes when he would talk about it. It was a very, very special experience for him. He talked about it a great deal. The Indianapolis News reported, The younger Holman came to look upon the event the way a Hoosier looks upon the state fair. It must go on. Always. Holman came for a look, and the place was in terrible condition. This was 10 months after Shaw had seen it the first time, so now it was even worse. Davidson said, I had locals tell me that they never thought it would come back after the war, after so many years of neglect. We just figured this was falling down, and when the war's over, this will be a housing development. I had one man tell me, we used to go over there, and the fence had all fallen down, so we could just walk onto the property, and we could hunt for rabbits, because the pit area was overgrown, and the infield was just like a jungle. Insiders have suggested that Tony was like Howard Hughes, in that he could look into the future, and see off into the distance as to what the possibilities were. He made several visits with other people, and apparently they were all appalled, but when they saw the grin on his face, they knew that Tony had already made up his mind. Davidson said that Tony Holman thought it was very important that the race be saved. He would say, I think it has to be saved so that Indiana can continue to have the 500-mile race, just as Kentucky has the Kentucky Derby. The deal was very quickly put together. The announcement was made on November 14, 1945. Davidson speculates that right up till the end, I think Wilbur Shaw still saw himself as the owner, but with Tony Holman as a major backer or partner. But when they came out of the meeting, Tony had bought it. Lock, stock, and barrel. Wilbur Shaw was to be the president and general manager and run the day-to-day -day operations. The headline of the Indianapolis News said, From driver's seat to swivel chair, Wilbur Shaw, three-time winner of the Speedway race, will sit this one out because he's the new president and general manager of the track, succeeding Captain Eddie. The Akron Beacon Journal quoted Holman as promising to provide a track and competition that should be an invitation and a challenge to the best drivers in the world. Davidson said that Holman and Shaw made an ideal partnership. Tony was very shy, very, very wealthy, but very, very down to earth and very shy, not pretentious at all. He was a gentle man. Everyone knew him in Terre Haute, but he was largely unknown in Indianapolis. But everybody knew Wilbur Shaw. Wilbur Shaw was internationally renowned, a dapper dresser, great speaker, charismatic. He was great with the media, the public, and the businessmen, and could get all kinds of things done. So he was kind of like the front man, and so the relationship worked out very, very well. The purchase was made, and they announced the race would be May 30th, 1946. But there was just a ton of work to do, Davidson explained. Almost immediately, they had to just come in and clear the place out. They had six months to clear all the debris and cut down the rotten trees and just basically prop the place up. The Indianapolis Star reported March 22nd that the renovation program cost $300,000. The entire plant has been renovated. Concrete for the new paddock stand across from the Press Pagoda was poured this week, and excavation work for the new Grandstand G is nearing completion. 
but the work continued to the very end. The track opened for practice on May 1st, but they didn't open to the public until the first qualifying weekend because they were still trying to string up telephone wires and things like that. 49-year-old indie veteran Cliff Berger won the pole position with a speed of 126.471 miles per hour. He was the oldest pole winner in indie history up to that point. But Holman was concerned about whether the race would be accepted by the public, since it hadn't been run for four years. Davidson explained that he was afraid that humans are creatures of habit, and they got used to not going, and maybe they will continue to not go. But the reverse was true. Everyone was back from the war and hungering for something. When you think about it, the 500 would have been one of the first major events to be revived. The Indianapolis Star reported in March that if the present advance demand for tickets for the 500-mile race to be held at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway May 30th continues, the 1946 event will hang up an all-time attendance record. Still, the size of the crowd took them unaware. There was a large infield, and they would park thousands and thousands of cars in there. For general admission, you just showed up. The crowd trying to get into the infield was huge, and Tony Holman got stuck in a traffic jam. And I think that all took them by surprise. Davidson continued, I've talked to people who said we were stuck in traffic around 16th Street and we were inching forward and inching forward and the race was half over and then there were these cars coming in the opposite direction and that was people who had been there at the start and they decided to leave early and so there was more congestion with traffic trying to get in and traffic trying to leave and we're yelling at the cars going by, who's leading? The crowd was absolutely massive. For most of the race, that would have been George Robson who led for 138 of the race's 200 laps taking the lead for good on lap 93. Tragically, Robson would perish in an accident later that year at Lakewood Speedway in Atlanta. It's difficult to estimate how important it is to the city of Indianapolis that they saved the racetrack that is still today lovingly nicknamed the Brickyard because at one point it was paid with some 3.2 million bricks that are still underneath the current pavement. But if they'd raised it in 1944 and just built a housing development, the race would be almost forgotten. And that's what Indianapolis is known for. And all the things that have happened to the city since, well, they might not have happened if Wilbur Shaw hadn't been so persistent, if he hadn't found Tony Holman. Davidson talks about how important the race is to the people of Indianapolis, how much they embrace the race. He says there's this group of fans, and they come back year after year, a huge group, and when they come up to you in their salutation, they will tell you how many times they've attended the race. Davidson's theory is that the average is 40 times. Wilbur Shaw dined in a plane wreck on October 30th, 1954, just one day shy of his 52nd birthday. Davidson said that the people in Indianapolis were thinking, well, who's going to run the track now? But Tony Holman had been watching him all those years and had become more comfortable and decided to take over as president of the track, a position he held clear until 1977 when he passed away from heart failure. The Holman family continued to own the Indianapolis Motor Speedway clear until it was sold to the Pinsky Company just this year. Of the man who saved the Speedway, Davidson told me that Tony Holman wasn't a ruthless businessman. He was just a very, very nice individual that had business sense. He wanted people to come and to be happy. Holman said, I don't expect to make a profit. I don't want to lose a lot of money, but I believe that this is going to be a going thing. When the race is over and we get the balance sheet, anything that we make could be put back into renovating the place and improving it. Davidson continued that every year they did something. Replace a grandstand, renovate the restrooms, something every year. People were amazed at how welcoming it was. There was just a, a wonderful feeling about it. The place had a great charm. Tradition was very important. The 104th running of the Indianapolis 500 will be held Sunday, August 23rd at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.